um, what was going on with this question. When it says £2,025,310, if you're really, really, really stuck, write out the things that you used to write like back in the day, like units, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions, and start putting in what we're told. So we're told two millions. How many hundreds of thousands? None. It goes straight to 25. So that's a zero of those, 25 of those, three hundreds, and ten pounds. So that's one zero there. Okay, so that's like the proper old school way to write it out. It would be more than acceptable to just write down what Miss wrote here, which is straight to that answer. But she's done that by using this in her head. Okay, if you're stuck, do that in your head. It'll help, uh, or, or write it down on the paper. You can write anywhere on that page which isn't examiner only. Okay. Uh, for the second bit, uh, we could even go and write that into into the columns. Make sure each number goes into each column. So we've got two, three, zero, zero, eight. So that is twenty three thousand. No hundreds, no tens. So I wouldn't say that. I'd just say twenty three thousand and eight. Okay. So 23,008. Make sure nothing accidentally pops in as a number. So now and again, when I'm marking work, I see that is actually written as an 8. It's got to be in all in words, okay? Is they don't actually use the numbers in the list. So I've seen that loads of times. I've, I've been on Foundation GCSE probably about four times the last five years. So I've had loads and loads and loads of experience in marking Foundation. I can tell you exactly where people go wrong. and They, they don't use the numbers in the list. So make sure you have... Write down two numbers that add up to 70, so 38 and 32. But don't be naive just to write those. Show that it actually does it. Go and check by here. So I've done 38, add 32. 8 add 2 gives me 10. Write down the unit, carry the 1. 3 add 3 gives me 6. Add the 1 gives me 7. Do a little check for everyone. Just be certain in your own mind that it definitely makes it. Uh, which number must be added to 37 to make 83? Now, I've said here the word check, but if truth be told, it wasn't really a check. I just did like a calculation, like the inverse operations of what number must be added to 37. I did 83, take away 37. When I did it, I said 3 take away 7. I didn't write down 4. It's not 4. It would be minus 4. You can't do that with this sort of method. So you borrow 1 from here so it becomes 7. This becomes 13. 13 take away 7 gives me the 6. 7 take away 3 gives me the 4. 46. Check. Is 46 in that list? There. Well, happy days, and I know it must be right, okay? And the final bit, multiple of six, that means something in the six times table. Um, again, sort of, you know it or you don't. If you need to, write down your six times table by the sides. Write it down, six, 12, 18, 24, and so on, and see until you get there and see, is, is that number in the list? Is that number in the list? There it was. So going through the next bit then, if I show like my full answer, I wrote it down. It didn't tell me anywhere to write that down in the column method. I just knew I had to. That's part of the technique of answering this successfully. Okay. Make sure that lines, like the columns, stay in nice, neat lines. Seven take away eight is, um, is something we don't want to answer. It's minus one. We don't want any negatives. Be careful writing one. I see that written all the time. Borrow one. Or steal one. You're never going to give it back to this guy here. So you take one from him. He becomes three. That's why I've now got one, which is now 17. 17 take away 8 gives me 9, 3 take away 2 gives me 1, 3 take away 2 again gives me 1, so the answer should have been 119. Okay, so this square number means a number times by itself, and it said it wants, uh, it wants it to be between 80 and 90. I've seen a question like more or less identical to that before, they just said it must have a tens digit of 8, so it's actually the same question. Um, so the square number that does that... Uh, is 81, which is 9 times 9. If it needs to be, you need to write out the square numbers. You need to know your first 12 square numbers off the top of your head. Okay, so square number means a number times by itself, so 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 3 times 3, and so on. You need to know those oh, quick recall. The quicker, the better. Uh, from this one then, write down the factors of 28. Factors mean numbers that are 28 or smaller. Multiples would be 28 or bigger. Okay, but it's something that two people do get confused between facts and multiples. Um, the best way for me to describe a factor would be uh, what number times by another number makes 28. So when I like to write them down, I like to get them in pairs, and people always forget that first one. They always forget one times by itself. So 28 and 1 are both factors of every single whole number there is. Okay. So never, ever, ever forget one in itself. And I'd start writing off in this pattern that you start off with 1 times by itself. Okay. Um, 
anything else, well, what other numbers times together to make 28? If you start writing it in this logical list here, start going up through the numbers. So one goes into it, yes, every single time. And if it only had one in itself going to it, it would be what we call a prime number. Now I'd try two. Now looking at 28, it ends in eight, which is an even number. So it must have two going to it. It's two times 14, halving the 28. So we get that one there. And then does three go into it? Well, you want to go through your three times table. Three times nine is 27. Then it goes to 30. So no, three doesn't. What about four? Yeah, yeah four does go into it. Four times seven. <coughs> Um, and then 5 doesn't end in 5 or 0, so no. 6, uh, well, 3 doesn't go into it, so it can't be in the 6 times tables either. 7, look, we're back to what we just had here. If you start repeating yourself, you're saying, oh, 7 times 4. We've already got those numbers written down. So as soon as I get 7, there's no more factors, okay? For that great question from the front, do you have to write it in words or numbers? You can actually write it, you can get the mark for writing three different answers here. Um, the way I've done it, is I've said that it is seven thousands. So I've written just like I did before, where you write, uh, if I zoom in a little bit, maybe I can do it a bit better, where you write it above it, so units, tens, hundreds, thousands, and then tens of thousands. Um, from there, you can either write in 7,000 like that, you could write in 1,000, and you'd actually get the mark there because it is thousands, or you could write it in words. So man down the front made the point, okay, thousand, okay. I alluded earlier to what a prime number is. A prime number is a number that only has like two factors, one in itself, okay. So when it says it has a tens digit of five, it could be 50, it could be 51, it could be 52, it could be all the way up to 59, okay. Immediately I can cross off that, cross off that, 54 is gone, 56 is gone and so on, why? Why not? What sort of number is 50, 52, 54? Even. Excellent. If you've got an even number, you know it can't be that. Okay. So no even numbers because 2 goes into all even numbers. Well, it could be this one here. 51, in fact, gut feeling is it, it could even be prime. But you need to know a couple of tricks. And the best trick you can use is if you add together the digits of that number. So 51, 5 add 1 gives me 6. Is that number, is something times 3 equal to 6. Is that true? Yeah, 3 times 2 is 6. If that number, 6, if that's in the 3 times table, then this number here is also in the 3 times table. In fact, it's 17 times 3. If you go home and practice your times tables, you'll know that too. Okay? So, 51 is not a prime number. So now I'm going to look at 53. Again, it's not even, so it's not in the 2s. 5 add 3. What's 5 add 3? 8, is that in the 3 times table? No, it's not. It goes 3, 6, 9, doesn't it? So eight's not in the 3 times table. That means this is not in the 3 times table. So this is a contender. 4, it can't be if it's not even. It doesn't go into any other even numbers times table. 5, does it end in 5 or 0? No, so it's not in the 5s. 6 is, we've already said no more evens. 7, uh, well, 7 squared, 7 times 7 is 49. And then it goes 56. So no, it's not in the 7 times table. Eights, no more even numbers, we said that. And nines, uh, if it's not in the threes, it's not in the nines. Um, it is a prime number. 53 is a prime number. Okay? If you go up through the first ten numbers, like I did going, right, two, four, six, and then threes and fives as well, you'll probably be fine to pick that number out. If it's that early on in the paper, they're not going to make it a really, really, really nasty number. Okay? They probably won't be doing a number like, is 163 a prime number? Uh, 59 is also a prime number if you went through the same procedures that I went through. When it says 84 divided by 6, I expect you to know up to 12 times 6. Okay, Ideally, you need to know up to 12 times 12, just off the top of your head. If you know what 12 times 6 is, you know it's 72. Then you know that it's not actually going to be the easiest question. Um, from there, you could either just carry on in your head. If you're like, right, 12 times 6 is 72. If I add on 6, that'll give me 78, so 13 times 6 is 78. And if I add on 6 again, I get 84, so that's 14 times. That's one way of doing it. But I use something called the bus stop method, which hopefully you're quite familiar with. Um, so I've got my number here, 6, dividing by, um, and I count. If I said count in 6s, how many 6s would I count until I get to 8? So if I start at 0 and then 6, that's 1, so that's why that 1 is there. But that got me to 6. If I went one further, I go to 12. You never go bigger. You've got to go back to the smaller one. 
And if you're on six and you want to get to eight, that leaves you with two left over. So that is what we call remainder. So that number is no longer four, it's now 24. How many sixes go into 24? Four. So up at the top. Okay? So going over this question, key words in it was fraction and simplest form. Make sure you've got that bit underlined because you'll lose a mark if you don't do what it says. So you have this shape here. How many of them are shaded? If you want to, go and write them on. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. If I wrote that in the right place. Uh, and that will give you six out of, but you've got to include them all now, okay? Not just the ones that aren't shaded over everything. So if you count through all those, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So your fraction should be six out of sixteen. But the key words saying simplest form meant that because these were both even, I had to halve top and bottom to get three over eight. Why haven't I divided that by two again to get one point five over four? Go on. It's not even. Fantastic. You can't have decimals going into fraction. So that's done now. That's in simplest form. Okay? The things that I picked out first, wherever it says you'll be assessed on the quality of your written communication, that will always be worth two marks. So out of those five marks, two of them of the QWC. That means the rest of them for mass. The mass is still the important bit. Don't get, like, overwhelmed thinking, oh, I've got to make sure this reads like an essay. You can do that bit after if you really, really want to. Okay? So, looking at the important information I've highlighted... Eight pounds, sixty pence. Be careful that straight away. They're trying to confuse you. Different units of um, of money, and then eighty p left over. How many pens did you buy? Okay. So the first thing I did was I did eight pounds take away eighty p. I've changed the eighty p into pounds by saying zero point eight zero, and then I've done something very similar to what I've already done like column method subtraction. So zero take away zero, zero. That's fine. Zero take away eight can't do. Borrow one. Blah 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 and get £7.20, okay? Now, here, I've got to work out how many 60p's go into £7.20. Can you see how I've changed my answer to being both in pounds? I looked at that as like 0 0.60, I thought, I don't actually like that. So I changed it both into pence, instead I thought it looked better like that. So £7.20 became 720p divided by 60p. My personal preference of writing out a division is that you do like the big number over the little number like that. Any zeros top and bottom can be cancelled. So now I'm just trying to work out how many sixes fit into 72. If needs be, if you are going blank, use the column, um, not column, sorry, bus stop method to do your division. And you get the answer is 12. So my answer is 12. Okay. Now what I've done then is I have written like a little bit of a mini essay. What I call it is a summary. So going back to the point you said, Alex, you said, oh, I don't know what to do. Do all your maths first and then just try and describe what you did to someone. You just think, right, these are the steps that I did. And never, ever take longer than two minutes because that's how long this is worth. This looks like I've spent ages. Honestly, I didn't. Okay, All I'm doing here is saying what I did. So firstly, I subtracted the 80p from £8 as there's 80, pay, 80, 80 pence change given. Truth be told, I don't need to write this. That's a waste of time because I already have it up here. This is just me trying to really sort of show you what a really, really, really full answer would look like. You wouldn't need to write that bit there. Um, next, I wanted to see how many 60p's went in £7.20s. I converted these prices into pence and divided top and bottom by 10. That's what I really have done to cancel the zeros. Um, I found that 12 sixes went into 72. This meant that there were 12 pence. Okay? So that would be like for a really, really, really full one. But this, this bit here, gets me three marks. <coughs> There's an argument to say, because my maths is clear as well, that I could get plus one out of these two QWC marks. So this summary is designed to be quick. Just talk through what you did. Okay? So it doesn't have to be like as big as mine. Mine was probably a little bit of a... Okay, a couple of things to talk about here. Um, first things first, you're told how many pupils were asked. Okay? If you weren't told, you can work it out really quickly by saying, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... 7 times by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 7 times by 5 will tell you there's 35 people there. Go and add up what you just tallied and check it adds up to 35 because if it doesn't, you've definitely gone wrong. Okay? Um, by all means, if you want to have a look at my answers here and check. Well, there you go. There's a mistake there because I didn't read the question. It should have been 35, shouldn't it? Okay? Um, check that it adds up to 35. Okay? 
If it doesn't, you are definitely, definitely, definitely wrong. Um, when you tally, what I would recommend doing, whenever you see a letter, don't cross out so you can never see it again like this. You're right, I'll never, ever know what that letter said ever again. Just put one neat line through it so you know that you have actually counted it. Okay? And when you tally it, you do your lines. I like to do it so it's like diagonals going across that. You don't have to do that. You can do them looking like this every time if you want. Okay? It's up to you. Um, then once you've tallied all of those, we've got 10, 6, 11, and 8, and that definitely is correct. It's just that 40 that wasn't. Um, that will get you two marks, doing the tallying correctly, I believe, yeah? And then frequency, saying how many were in your tally. Um, the next mark comes in, if I put this in now, by drawing your bar graph correctly, okay? Now, it's very, very important that you label your axes. I did give that hint a second ago. Um, you'll lose a mark straight away if you don't. So frequency, although I did see Sheridan, what do you have written down? Hmm? What do you have written down for yours? Because you didn't have the word for pupils asked. Absolutely fine, okay? For me, the word frequency is maybe just easier to write down, which I like to write it, okay? Total is fine, okay, as long as it's giving you some sort of idea. Frequency is like a shorthand way of doing that, okay? Um, the other one is just sport or type of sport or whatever. You have to leave a gap. Now, I know what I would say as a maths teacher. I'd say, yes, you should be leaving a gap because cricket and football aren't related. They're not, they shouldn't be touching. However, if you do actually have those touching, you will get that marked fully. Okay? You shouldn't really, but they do actually give it in the GCSE. Um, things to notice here. Again, I'm going to zoom right in on my axes here. Very pleased I saw Alex, you writing this down, that the three must be on the line. It must be on that, not hovering in the middle there. It should not be here. That would be wrong. Okay, it's got to be physically on that line. You don't have to go through and do like a little marker like that everywhere, as long as it's just obvious it's not hovering in the middle. Um, anything else, um, just be careful how wide you do the bars. In some respects, it might have made sense to just do them as one width bars, and that way you definitely know you're going to have them all, um, all in on the same diagram. It doesn't matter if you don't use all the space here to the left. It doesn't matter if you don't use any of this space at all. Similarly, someone asked me, said, oh, what about the space up here? Absolutely fine to leave that. If, that. if you have a nice scale that works well, it's best to stick with that. Okay? Can I just chip in, Mr. Ashton? However, if it's really, really, really tiny and you've got loads of space on the side and loads of space above, you would drop a mark because you've got to use the space that you've been given. So you can leave a little bit, but don't draw this minuscule, tiny little graph that you need a magnifying glass to read. Does that make sense? Yeah, ideally, you don't want any of these bars. So again, if I zoom in on the bars... They shouldn't be hovering in the middle of a line like this where you've had to say, all oh, right, here's 10, here's 14, I've got 11, so about there. It shouldn't be like that. It should be really nice and obvious. It will always be towards the start of the paper if they do that, okay? Um, it, sh it should be nice and easy, nice and simple to, to do. The second bit asks for mode. Mode means most often, okay? If you look at the words here, if I zoom in on the word mode, you've got M-O, most often. You need to be thinking of that. What uh, some people do is they write down just 11. The answer is not 11. The one that is most often is 11 that belongs to hockey. Okay, You've got to make sure that word hockey is also in there. You don't have to write the 11, but I like to write down what is the most often one there. 11, who does it belong to? And then finally, find the probability that a child chosen at random from this group prefers cricket. How many of them did like cricket? Go back and read the graph. 10 out of? 10 out of 35 would be absolutely fine. That would get you the full marks. You can put it in simplest form if you want. That's two sevenths. But it didn't ask you. You might do it wrong. So unless it asks you, I wouldn't bother. Okay? So that would get you the one mark there for hockey. Two marks. So one for the 10, one for the 35. Or one inch of those. Okay, it says the formula for the speed of a stone um, thrown from the top of a building is, and it gives you this formula. Now, what I've done is I've highlighted like what the speed of the stone is, what time is, and what the starting speed is. And in the question, they'll give you two of those pieces of information. So hopefully there, the way I've highlighted it, you can see it's sort of linked up here. And I find that really, really, really useful way of sort of like visualising what is going on. Because I heard someone say, I hate these. And a lot of the kids who I've taught in the past don't like these questions, especially part B. They don't mind part A, yeah. but part B they really, really dislike. Um, so looking at this bit here, 
we know that the time is 4. So I've changed time for 4 because I'm told here that it's 4. And then I know starting speed is 15. Now I've written the words in here, bid mass. Now that's something you're taught in year 7. It's, so it's very, very easily forgotten because the last time you probably did it was in like year 8. It still needs to be used here. You've got to do the multiplying bit first. Okay? Then add on the 15. Sometimes this comes up in a calculator paper. Your calculator is programmed to do bid mass. So that's great. But we haven't got a calculator for this. So we had to do 4 times 10 first. That's 40 plus the 15. Okay? Right then. Can I give you one more minute? Okay, I was just talking to the boys at the front. And I said it's actually very, very, very easy to pick up one of these two marks here. But the part B's is one that common, commonly people in foundation hate. They really don't like it. Um, what you had to do to get one mark was literally just chuck in the things that you're told. So you're told that the starting speed is 20. So going back to that formula there, that's why 20 is there. Speed of the stone is 45, so that's gone in there. 45 equals time times 10 add 20. For doing that, gets you one of the two marks. Now, using bid mass, I know I should be doing the times a bit first, but I can't. So what I'm doing is I'm working backwards through this to get rid of anything that's not multiplying. I'm getting rid of the adding first. So I'm solving it like an equation. So to do that, I'm getting rid of the plus 20 from each side. So plus 20, take away 20, but whatever I do to one side must do to the other. So that then gives me 25 equals time times 10. Now I'm going to get rid of the times by 10 bit by dividing by 10. So dividing each side by 10. And 25 divided by 10 gives 2.5. If you're unsure, write down what you've got in like columns, just like we looked at before. And then dividing by 10 moves those numbers, these numbers here, move each of them to one place to the right. So we're going to get 2.5 <coughs> there. Okay? So that's how you can get it if you weren't sure. So going over this one here, the thing that's really important, it says that each, uh, there's two identical rectangles, each measuring three, uh, 3 by 8, and two identical squares. So if I start looking here, what I've done is I've gone and started putting in what the measurements are. So I said if this is the identical, this is clearly the rectangle, this must have been 8 then. 3 and 8, so up here must have been 8. This is my square. Now because that's 3, then that must be 3 as well because it's a square, all the sides are the same. So then rectangle has then been rotated around by 90 degrees, so now it's 3 by here, 8 by here, and then 3, 3, and 3. How did I work out that was 5 though? Excellent. If this is 8 and this bit's 3, then this must be what's left over. So 8 take away 3 will tell us how to work that out. Why have I gone around and written it on every single bit of that, that diagram? Why have I bothered to do that around here? Why have... Not because I'll forget it. You have to do it. No, I don't have to. It helps you do something. Add them up for... What are we asked in the next bit? Perimeter. Perimeter, yeah. You don't have to do this. Maybe it's a little bit of overkill. But for me, it makes it very, very obvious like what I have to do next. So when it says, calculate the perimeter of the shape, can you see that I put a star by here? That star is me thinking, right, I've got to do one lap of this shape, so I've got to go here, then here, then here, all the way around, and get back to that star. And you've got to add them. It is massively important that you show you know how or you know that they're adding. So look how long this line here is. I didn't particularly want to write this. I knew it was going to be a bit of a pain in the backside to write out. But fundamentally, it shows an examiner, I know perimeter is when I add all of the sides together. Okay? I would do. I'd write down the whole thing. Okay? If you did it in your head and you got 50, brilliant. If you go wrong, which is quite easy to go wrong with, you're going to lose a mark. Okay, potentially two marks. Because that was weird. Okay, so this first question here, they've given you the first row. Now, the most important one for me is percentage. That means 25 divided by 100. That's what percentage means. So, again, using our thing that we used before, if you said, right, think of write them down into their columns um, and so on. We've got 25 divided by 100 will give us that moving one, two columns to the tenths, 
that moving one, two columns to the hundredths, getting 25 there, but you must get your decimal point in there, and you can never leave the units blank, so that's what is 0 0.25, so that's what's happened there. Um, also, this is a fraction. That is a fraction. It didn't say anywhere that it had to be in simplest form. So 25 over 100 would actually be more than acceptable to write there, but what they have done is they have cancelled down. So they said, right, that ends in a 5, that ends in a 0, that means they're both in the 5 times table. How many 5s go into 25? 5. How many 5s go into 100? 20. You saw one to know off the top of your head, that one. And then because um, 5 and 0 again, we can divide by 5 again, so it goes 5 into 5 once, 5 into 24, so that's how they got a quarter there. Okay? Using that will hopefully make this bit really, really easy for us. 40% would just be 40 divided by 100, just like that. And then I've done exactly the same principle here, that I've moved the 40 over two columns, so we get 0 0.040, but you don't need to write in that one there. If I do write that one in, will I lose the mark? No. No, it's still correct, you just don't need to, it's just a waste of ink. Okay? And then here, you can see that I've written 40 out of 100, fine. If you can, and you feel confident enough, cancel it down. 4 over 10, 2 over 5. Okay? It doesn't say in the question you have to, so if it doesn't, no. But it might say in your question, it might be identical, but it might say cancel any fractions down in the simplest form. If it says that, you will. Okay? And then final one, 0 0.3. Well, I've changed that to being 3 over 10 because I've just said, uh, if that's the 3 there, I've worked in the opposite way to what I just did. So I've times that by 10. Again, to go up that column, so that would give me 3 divided by 10, would move him into that column. So then to make that into a percentage, I need that to be out of 100, times that by 10, times that by 10, to get 30 out of 100, which is 30%. Okay? The first one is easily the easiest one. Okay, it tells you that he wins twice, he draws once, he loses once. Okay, so he's going to get 3 points for a win, then another 3 points, then 1 point, and then you're going to take away 2 points. So I've just written that literally in the line. I've said 3 plus the 3, this gives 6, plus 1 gives 7, 7 take away 2, gives an answer of 5. Okay? The other ones are altogether a bit harder. It says Mary plays the game four times and ends up with a final score of 0. Write down the number of wins, draws, and loses that Mary had. Justify your answer. Okay? You're going to use a little bit of trial and improvement here. You're going to have to have a guess because that's the only thing you can really do. So I've tried to get some numbers that work. So I've got 3, 1, and minus 2. They're the numbers I know I must use. And I spotted that 3 adds 1 gives me 4. Then taking away 2, taking away another 2 gives me 0. Okay, they're the numbers from here. So that was a win, that was a draw, and two losses. So in terms of justifying my answer, well, I feel I've done that because it's really, really obvious what I've done. Okay, I've shown how I got 0. I said 3 plus the 1 is 4. Take away 2, take away 2 is 0. Okay? And the next one underneath, I know that John's played five times. He has a final score of minus four, so I know he's not done very well. I know he's got quite a few losses. And again, I've just had a play. I've got one plus one, so that gives me two. Take away two gives me zero. Take away two, take away two again will give me minus four. That's five games. And again, I feel I've justified my answer because I've shown exactly what's happened here to get that answer of minus four. Maybe the only thing I could do to improve this answer is stick on the end equals minus 4 there, and then it'd be perfect, okay? Um, we talked a little bit as a class about the actual height of a man, and you can do it in feet or metres, it doesn't matter. Now, the best one you can do is 6 foot for a man, but if you said 5 foot, you'd actually get marked correctly, so there are men who are 5 foot. And similarly, you could have said 7 foot, because there are men who are 7 foot, very rare, but there are people who are 7 foot. Two metres is actually ridiculously tall for a man. If anyone went to Penchpoith, that's Mr. Davis. Anyone ever go to Penchpoith? Yeah. yeah. Was he still there? Like, year six teacher, really tall guy? He was two metres. I can remember because he used to go up to the door. And his head used to, like, touch the door frame. And he used to say, well, I'm exactly two metres, which is what a door frame is. Yeah. Okay? Uh, two metres, about seven foot. Okay? The door is a really, really good estimate for two metres as well. But men are, there can be some men who are two, uh, two metres. Okay, so the big issue, thank you, the big issue that I have normally marked this is people actually go and physically measure how tall he is and say, oh, the man is one and a half centimetres. Don't do that. It says actual height of the man. Okay, so that means how tall is he really? There's no men who are two and a half centimetres big. Okay. Um, 
The next bit you want to do, it says, using the estimate for the height of man, estimate the actual height at the top of the bus. Now, the best way for me to do that is I like to measure exactly how tall that guy is, and then, say it was like three centimetres, every multiple of three, I go and mark on the ruler. So there's six foot, there's 12 foot, there's 18 foot. As you can see, 18 foot is too big for me. That's actually bang in the middle of these two values here. So if that's a distance of six in between here, halfway between six is adding on another three, <coughs> which gives me 15. So I've done it in feet by here, but in the brackets, I've done it in metres if you want to do it in metres instead. My class, who do doing foundation as well, they actually prefer doing it in metres because it's smaller numbers. It's not quite as sort of thought-provoking as doing it in the, in the metres, in the feet. But it doesn't matter. It's your call. OK? Ben, thank you. The first thing I need to talk about is what is a rhombus? What, what is a rhombus? Can anyone tell me what a rhombus is? It's the thing on the paper. It's, it is and it's not. <laughs> It's that shape there, it doesn't need to have that line going through it. A rhombus is like a square that's pushed over. A parallelogram is like a rectangle that's pushed over. So that means, a square, means that all the sides are the same, and that's actually really, really important to understand this question fundamentally. Because some of you have sort of like guessed what's going on, and I've been quite impressed that you're just, your intuition is very, very good. But I want to talk through what the real um, reason is why this has worked. Also, the other thing that you need to remember for this is angles in a triangle add up to 180. In the four side shape, someone said 360. To be fair, in the rhombus, it is 360. It's not a silly answer. Um, and what's special if I do these things here? They're equal. They're equal. What are equal? Equal the same sides. The sides are equal, and it also means these angles here are equal. I like to draw those in as little eyes, because then you'll remember that this angle here... <laughs> and this angle here are the same, okay? That's fundamentally massively important in this question, okay? So going on to my shape here, I'm going to zoom in just on this bit here. Because it's a rhombus, I know this side here, this side here are the same. So I've then said that the angles under here, these things acting like eyebrows, these angles must be the same. So this... Okay, so going back to where we were... We said that these sides here had to be the same, so that meant I could say that was also 37 degrees here because of that 37. Okay? Now, how have I gone and worked out that's 106 there? What have I done to work that out? From? Fantastic. I have to add together the two sides that I know, or the two angles I know, sorry, and that gives me 14 there. Carry the 1, 3 add 3 is 6, add the 1 is 7, and then doing 180 angles in a triangle, which is what I have here take away the 74, 0 take away 4 I can't do, so I borrow 1, 10 take away 4 is 6, 7 take away 7 is 0, 1 take away nothing is 1, tells me that's 106. The other thing that is really, really special about rhombuses and what it expects you to know is that opposite angles are identical in rhombuses. Okay, So this line here, a couple of you, so Sharon, I was actually very impressed by you, you went, this is 37 degrees and this is 37 degrees there as well. That was just your intuition told you that. That is also yeah. true, and that's because this angle here and this angle here is also identical, and they've been split in half by this diagonal. Um, but it's maybe using a bit of luck. The way that I've done it here, by putting those dashes on there, knowing that's 37, 37, taking away that from 180 to the triangle and saying opposite angles in a rhombus so are equal, that's the real reason why. Okay, So it's important that we went through that today just to make sure that we are aware of that. Okay? Um, OK, so the part two, right, I've somehow gone and worked out this is 41 here. We can't see any working, so how have I done that? How am I able to go and say this is 41? I what have I done? I didn't work there. Good. And then take that answer and take that away from 360. Why 360? Because that's the shape. It's a four-sided shape. All four-sided shapes add up to 360. No matter what they look like, if they've got four sides, inside is 360. So likewise with our triangles, when it's three sides, it's 180. When you add them up, I'd recommend that you're doing it in what's called the column method, going in descending order. So the biggest number first, down to the smallest number. You don't have to, but it maybe makes things a little easy or easier. Make sure the units column all matches up, etc., etc. Okay? So adding all those together, 2 add 6 is 8, add the 1 is 9. 3 add 2 is 5, add the 6 is 11. So write down the unit, carry the 1, and then 1 add 1 add 1 is 3. So we've got 319 there. 
So then I've done 319 take away, I've subtracted that from 360. Okay, again, zero take away nine isn't nine. Common misconception, you've got to borrow one from here, it becomes five, 10 take away nine is one, five take away one is, uh, is four, and then three take away three is zero. Don't need to put in the zero. So that's how I was able to work out that number. If you wrote that as 41, well done, because a lot of people say, why is 41? Now I know it says in the question, this diagram is not drawn to scale, However, this clearly doesn't look like 41, it's clearly an obtuse angle, so I'm expecting that to be over 90, although this line does mean that it might be a load of nonsense. Go on. So going from here, there we go, I have my other working by here from that bit that I've replicated. So 180, take away that 41, gave me 139. So if you've got 139 on that, well done, because you look at three marks there, look, three processes here, okay? Okay, the first bit, I've got to say, I've gone around and looked around most of the class. You've done really, really well, okay? This question here is eight marks. I'm actually, with my class, I'm actually quite happy they get the four. The next four marks are really, really, really tough. So you want to get the first four. They're very, very, very doable. And it's about getting, you know, some of the marks and not missing all of the marks here. Not just looking at it and going, oh, it's so much information, I can't be bothered to do it. Okay, so it will always tell you somewhere in the question what's happening. It tells you that if you pick the number on the blue card and then get a number on the red card, you multiply the numbers together. So hopefully you'll get those numbers there. So hopefully that's looking good. So then if I pick this one here, I got that number there by doing 4 times by 1. I got this 20 here by doing the 5 times by the 4. Why have I highlighted these ones green? Any idea? Good, they're the ones over 10 for the next part. So the next part, I'll come and squeeze to it up by here, it says a player wins a prize by getting a score of 10 or more. 10 or more includes 10. Was 10 there? It was, so 10 or more must be this one as well. If you haven't included that one, you'll get it wrong. Okay? Now, um, someone said to me, they said, can I cancel that down? Don't bother. It's not asking you to do that. Probability is different skill to cancel down fractions. Even if you can, I'll just leave it. Okay? The next bit says, 60 people each play the game once, approximately how many people would win a prize? Someone asked me, so they said, oh, isn't it 25? And I just said, look, I don't know, I can't work it out like that in my head that quickly. It's very impressed to be hearing that. You want to be using something like what I've done. What 5 out of 12 means, it means that if I play the game 12 times, I'd expect 5 winners. I'd expect that. Whether it would actually happen is something different, that's called relative frequency. But this is like our theoretical probability. I don't want to play it 12 times, I want to play it 60 times. What do I do to 12 to turn it into 60? I times it by 5, okay? Whatever I do to the bottom, I must do to the top. So out of 60 um, times the game's played, I'd expect 25 people to win, okay? And then finally, for the last bit, so only two marks here, there's an awful lot of writing, an awful lot of work to do here. You're getting 60 people play the game, and it costs 80p to play the game once, um, if the 60 people play the game once, approximately how much profit do you expect it to make? So what I said was 60 players at 80 p each. So I did 6 times 8 is 48, and then I added the zeros on the end to get 48,000. No, I didn't. 4,800. Um, that's in pence. To turn that into pounds, I would divide it by 100 because 100 pennies go into a pound. Okay. So I turned that into 48 pounds. I then know I'd be getting 25 people win at £1.50 each. So what I did was that skill that we talked about before about partitioning things. So 25 times by a pound is £25. And then £25, pound, uh, 25, pound, 25 winners, got there in the end, times by 50p. Now a really clever way of thinking about 50p is think of it as a pound. How much of a pound is 50p? Half a pound. So it's just going to be half of this answer here. So half of 25 is £12.50. So then putting those together will give a total of £37.50. I took in 48 quid and I'm giving out 37.50. So what calculation can I do to work out the profit? Excellent. 48 minus the 37.50. And again, you can see I've used column methods. So same ideas that we've used throughout the paper being used over and over again. And then finally working that out Give me an answer of £10.50. Okay, looking at this one here, the all-important thing that you must, must, must include, when I've highlighted my 5A, there's no sign in front of the 5A, so that's fine to do what I've done there. But this 6A here isn't 6A. It's minus 6A. You must include that sign. So if you're starting to, like, group your terms together, you must include it's minus there. 
Now there's no more A's, so I've gone with a different highlighter and highlighted anything with a B in it, including its sign. Okay, so I've had plus 3B there and then minus B there. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer anything with, uh, with an A in it. So I've got 5A minus 6A, so that would give me 5 minus 6 being minus 1, and then A because they're both A's, minus 1A. Absolutely fine to write as minus 1A, but you'll probably see it in my solution as just minus A. Fine either way. Okay. The other one, I've got 3B, and then I want to take away B. Anything that is a B has a coefficient, a number in front of it, which is one that we just tend not to write. 3 take away 1 is 2. So I've got 2 Bs. Oh, we've deleted absolutely everything we've done so far. Okay. So if I scroll down, see my answer there. What sort of B is that? 2B. It's a positive 2B, so I've included its sign there. Okay. Um, the next one down uh, was actually done very, very well. And I had a little look around. To get rid of the divider by 5, you do the opposite of dividing, which is timesing. Times that side by 5, you must times this side by 5. You get the answer, 50. Now, the one thing I'd always recommend you do, you're saying x is equal to 50. Chuck in 50 into that. 50 divided by 5 equals 10. Is that true? It is true. Well, that means you're definitely right. You, you know if you've got that mark. Okay? The next one down was very, very similar to that speed of the stone question we had ages ago now. Um, what you need to do to solve an equation is get this x term on its own. To do that, you get rid of anything that is not physically attached to the x first. Is that 3 attached to the x? Yeah. yeah. Don't get rid of him first, then. Get rid of this guy first. How do I get rid of plus 7? You minus 7 to both sides. Good. Okay, so I've got my arrow down, minus 7 to both sides. What is 19 take away 7? 12. And then on this side here, I've just got the 3x. That plus 7 take away 7 is gone. Okay, there is a sign in between this 3 and the x that we don't write because it looks a little bit like the letter. Any idea what that is? Times. times. I've got to get rid of the time sign, so to get rid of the times, I divide. Okay? I divide by 3, and I must do that to both sides. Um, so 12 divided by 3 gives me 4. 3x divided by 3 gives me just the x. Okay? That's the whole reason you always divide by that number. It just gets rid of it. Okay? Um, right, this question here, the first time you see this, go, oh, how are we supposed to do that? And the truth be told, you probably won't. You probably need to be shown exactly how to go through it. Although, I've got to say, I'm impressed that the girls ask a very, very useful question, which answered it for some of us. Um, it says, for each of the following statements, circle whether it's true or false, and you must give an explanation um, for your choice. All prime numbers are odd. What is a prime number? We talked about this before. A number that only has itself go into it, and one. Fantastic. So, is one a prime number? What numbers times together to make one? One times one. Well, how many factors has that got then? Just one. It's got two numbers times it, but they're the same numbers, so it's only one factor. So, one is not a prime number. It's like a common misconception that people assume it is. It's not. What about two? What numbers times to make two? Two times one. Any others? No, so no others, so that is a prime number. So that means all prime numbers are odd. There's no more even prime numbers because 2 goes into every other number that's even. But 2 is a prime number, so my answer here is false. And because 2 is a prime number, it only has two factors. This bit here, maybe slight overkill, but for, a, for an exam, if you're only going to do it once, it would be nice to give a lovely answer, wouldn't it? This one here, the first time I read it, I actually marked it down as true. If you have any whole number ending in 8, you'll always get a number ending in 4. And I mark that as true. Did anyone else do that? No. Yeah. And then someone showed me, no, it's false. I was like, why? And they showed me, so well, what's 18 divided by 2? It's like, yeah, it's 9. So anything with an odd number in front of it here doesn't, okay? But like I said, I actually fell for that myself, not at your age, as a teacher. Okay, so it's easy to fall for that one. So now that you've heard that, and I'm hoping it goes into your minds, if anything like this comes up in your exam, you go, oh, hang on, there are weird things that happen this one. So part B, Eleanor says, when you multiply any whole number 
by the one before it, the result is always an even number. Explain why she corrects. Okay, so what I've done is I've written out my numbers here. One, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. Why have I highlighted every other one blue? Any ideas? There are numbers, so the green ones are all the even numbers, okay? Now, I said because... You might see the answer to the next one there. Because numbers go odd, even, odd, even, blah, 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 you will always multiply by an even number. So pick any number there. So if I pick the 5, multiply by the 1 before it, that's 5 times 4. Pick this number here, the 9, 9 times 8. Pick the number here, 10, 10 times 9. If I do it using that rule, I will always be multiplying an odd and an even number. Whenever you multiply it by any even number, the result must be even. Okay, so for instance, if I pick 4, times it by 7, which is an odd number, I'm still counting 4s, so 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, everything in the 4 times table is even, hence that number has to be even. Okay, but I'll leave that on there for a second, so you may want to get that down. I felt that was a really tricky question to ask, and I'd be betting a lot of money that hardly anyone got that in the actual exam. The first time you see that, if you've not really thought about it before, you probably haven't got time to really think about it in the exam. It's the sort of one that if it comes up, a bit of a red herring like that, only two marks, only spend two minutes on it, don't spend any longer. If you're not getting anywhere, move on. If you've got time at the end, go back. But two minutes, don't spend longer than that, because it's a hard one to think about. You can't revise that, no. I mean, Okay, and so for number 13, the key word product, what does product mean? It's a posh word for something that you do all the time. Time's, Time's in good. Index form, thank you, index form is with indices, so like 2 squared times 3 to the power of 4 and stuff like that, okay? That's what that means. Um, whenever you've got 150, people have got this idea, I, I hate doing it myself, where they start doing everything by 2, so it'll be something in 2, something in 2, something in 2, something in 2. I don't like doing that myself personally because you get a really long skinny tree. If it ever ends in 0, the best thing you can do is pick out that it's times by 10, and then all you have to do is hide the zero from there. So if we hide that zero there, we're left with just 15. So 15 times 10 have a product of 150. They times together to make 150. So if it ever ends in zero, top tip, do it times by 10. It'll make it easier, I swear. Okay? Going from there, at either those prime, not a bad idea to write out what your first 10 primes are. I know the first 10. Okay. If you know the first five, you'll probably be fine with this question anyway. We've already said earlier that one is not a prime number, so your primes are two, three, five, seven, eleven. If you know up to there, you'll probably be all right. And then the next five, 13, 17, 19, 23, and 29. Okay. If you know those, it's going to make your life so much easier and not, not actually have to think, oh, hang on, what's it mean to be a prime number again? Just learn it, okay? Um, 10, then. What numbers times together to make 10, 2, and 5? Are those numbers in my list? There's 2, there's 5. So I put a circle around those, because they're both in the prime number list. Then 15, what times together to make 15? 3 times 5, there's 3, there's 5. So I can circle both those. I'm done, yeah? So so that it doesn't. So, going back to what I said over by here, what times 2 does make 150? 75. 2 is prime. 75 is not because it ends in 5, but off the top of my head I'm thinking, oh, what times to make 75? I don't know, off the top of my head if I'm being really honest. Um, 15 times 5. Okay, I'll take your word for it. So that is prime, that is not. So then I go ahead and do 5 times 3. And look at that, if you look at the numbers that are circled, they're identical to the ones that I had here, so it really doesn't matter which way you go as long as it obviously is correct. Okay? To then put it into index form, this bit here, by the way, is worth two marks. To put it into index form, I like to see that you're writing out this long list here. Some people like to skip straight on to the next bit, which you can if you really want to, but it's not a bad idea to write the list out first. Um, how many twos have I got? Just the one. So I could write, if I wanted, two to the power of one. But it's sort of like a waste of ink. You don't need to. You can just say two. How many threes have I got? Again, just the one. How many fives have I got? Two, so it's five squared. Why is it at times in between? Because of this word here being product. That's why I've highlighted that green. That's what that means. They have to be time signs. I see add signs in now again. And sometimes I see no signs. If you don't put the time signs, you will lose that mark.
The part B bit is hard, you know, if you don't get that, we're not going to be gutted. You've got to know what it means to be a perfect square. Does anyone know what the definition is off the top of their heads? And I'm expecting no one to, to know it. That's what a square is, certainly. What's it mean in relation to this thing, though, up here? Right, definitely write this definition down. To be a perfect square, powers or indices, I like to say the word powers, powers must be even. So you need to write that down if you haven't got it, okay? That's the wrong thing there. Powers must be even. So make sure you've got that written down. That's what it means to be a perfect square. So going back up here, what powers aren't even looking at this thing here? Is that an even power? Yeah. Is this one an even number? No. No, so that's not an even power. Is this an even power? No. No, is this an even power? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fine. We don't need to worry about that, but we do need to make this an even power. So I times it by three, because three times three would be three squared. And I'd have to times it by two. What's two times three? Six. That's what my answer is for that bit there, okay? So, what is the smallest positive whole number that 150 can be multiplied to make a perfect square? Making the powers even, I'd have to multiply 2 and 3, because then 2 times 2 would give me 2 squared. Bang, even powers. 3 times 3 give me 3 squared. They don't all have to be squares. You could have it that it was 5 to the power of 4. As long as it's an even number, it's grand. Okay? But a tricky one, that. That is hard, that bit. And like I said... The best way to look at this is it's one mark, and if you get it, brilliant. You're thinking, oh, another mark in the bag. If you don't get it, it's only one mark. I'm expecting, certainly in my class, I said, look, we've got 30 marks that we can lose to get our C. We're targeting 70 to get a C. Really like the thing that I do to like always remember these. So I've just done this with Max, because apparently, according to this, a lot of you have made the same mistake. But in some respects, it's, it's not the worst mistake you can make, because you're showing you've got a lot of knowledge of C-grade material. Um, this word here, group frequency diagram. This word in particular, the diagram bit, tells you it must be a bar graph and the bars must touch. You know that bar graph we did earlier where I said, ideally, I wouldn't have the bars touching? That's because that data is not related, like cricket and football, different things. The bars shouldn't touch. For a free group frequency diagram, this bit here is telling me that it is a bar graph and the bars touch. The other thing that some of you are doing where you're plotting the midpoints and drawing a line graph, that is called a frequency polygon, okay, or a grouped frequency polygon. So they are awfully similar in terms of what they're called. You've got to get it in your head that a group frequency diagram has two important things. It's a bar graph and where the bars touch. A frequency polygon is a line graph plotted at the midpoints, okay? So if you want to make that note somewhere on at the rest of the page, which we could do by here. So I'm just going to write it at the top, say frequency polygon, number one, line graph, number two, midpoints. Okay, but you're going to write a bit neater than me, I'm just writing very quickly, okay? Not a bad thing to have written down there and get it stuck into your heads, okay? So look at what we had here. We had a bar that should have run from 50 to 55 that had a frequency of 4. So that looks like that, 50 to 55, frequency of 4 here. If I want to go and work out what the scale is, I do that by doing the following. I work out what that first number on the um, grid is, so that's 10, and I divide it by how many little jumps go up to there. How many little squares go into it? 10. So 10 divided by 10 is... One. one, so each tiny little square is one. one. I mean, that's quite a nice scale, this one. But if that said 20 there, you do 20 divided by 10 to work out each little jump was worth two. If it was 30, 30 divided by 10 and so on, okay? So that is what your graph should have looked like. And that was your two marks. The most important thing um, I think it is to do is actually to go and write what each of the frequencies are on the top of the bars. So you see 20 there. I've just written 20 on top of the bar, so then 30, 15, 5 and 5. So hopefully the question is quite straightforward. It says, how many logs did Billy collect and measure? Well, all of those added together, which is 75. Okay? For the second bit, it said, was it Tom or Billy who collected longer logs on average? And the reason why it's Tom, so Tom was the, the first guy, 
I said, Tom's graph has the biggest bar at longer lengths. So I think you had something very similar written to before me. So if I have a quick check of what it looked like before. Okay then, so, key thing with this question, really easy to miss. I did this with someone tutoring last year, and it took us ages the first time. Like, hang on, there's so much stuff going on, and it's like really, really mean with some of the stuff that it does. It serves four people here. What's it ask you for on your side? Eight. 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 So whatever you find out here when you convert the measurements, you're going to have to then double, okay? Very easy to miss that, so just be careful. Right, first things first. Let's have a little sort of pan around this question. It says one cup is approximately 240 milliliters. Four ounces is approximately 115 grams. One tablespoon is 50 milliliters. So four ounces of butter I know is... 115 grams. That's what it told me just a little bit sort of further down the page. If 4 ounces is 115, then 8 ounces must be 213. It must be double. And then to get uh, 12 ounces, what do you notice about 4 and 8? What do I do to 4 and 8 and get to do to get 12? 4, add the 8, okay? So if I add together 115 and 230, I get 345 grams which is 12 ounces of pasta. One onion is one onion. That's fine, we don't have to do anything with that. Two tablespoons of stock. What if one is 15 millilitres? Oh, hang on. Wouldn't it be two onions? It will be in the final question, oh. yeah. yeah. Um, this must be 30 millilitres here. Uh, and then two-thirds of a cup of cream. These last two here require a bit of work. So I've done the work down by here. So if I know one cup is 240 millilitres... I want to get uh, two-thirds of a cup. To find two-thirds, I divide by the denominator here of the, the fraction. So I do 240 divided by th uh, 3. Cover up the zero. What's 24 divided by 3? 8. Add the zero on, so I get 80 millilitres. Now that finds one-third. To find two-thirds, I double it to get 160. The three ounces of cheese, that was really hard. I did four ounces is 115, so two ounces must be half of that. And can you see by the side here, I partitioned the 115 into 110 and 5 and halved them individually and then put them back together to get 57.5. Then to find one ounce, I did exactly the same thing again to the 57.5, 57 and 0 0.5, halved each of those, put them back together. So to find three ounces, I wanted to add together just those bits there, okay? When I did that, I got the answer 86.25 grams. So that's all of the answers for four people. To get that now for eight, I need to start doubling all of those individual things I just worked out. So hopefully, some of them are easy enough. However, some of them are going to be a little bit more tricky. 160 times two... Double it if you want, uh, partition it if you want. What did I do? I didn't, I didn't partition that one, but you could do to 160. Double 100 is 200, double 60. 120 is 320. 86.25 grams times by two. You can see by here, I partitioned it into 86 and 0 0.25 and doubled each of them individually, put them back together, and you're done. Okay?